Good morning. I hope you're enjoying <laughs> these white-tailed eagles brought to us by the Latvian Fund for Nature as much as we are. It's a windy old day there in Latvia at the moment, but great to see these three youngsters. Now, we did first look at them a couple of weeks ago. They've grown considerably in the interim period. They've got rid of that first light coat of down, and they've now got this very much thicker and greyer coat of down. Looks like they're needing it in Latvia this morning. As I say, pretty windy by the look of it. Um, this is one of a number of things that you can find on YouTube if you put in Latvian fun for nature. I've got to say they're all excellent stuff. They've got fantastic goshawk, black stork, all sorts of things, other eagle species as well, worth checking out. These are amazing pictures of white-tailed mm. eagle. See the size of the nest there? When they're built in a tree, they're typically about one and a half meters across, sometimes two meters deep. So they're a formidable nesting structure. They like them to be within at least one and a half kilometers of some sort of water. We can't see any water there, but one could only presume that there's a lake or, or maybe the coast, of course, uh, nearby. And they don't really like nesting in isolated trees. Golden eagles will do that, but white-tailed eagles like this like to nest in woodland. And you can see there that there's certainly younger trees beneath that nest tree, and there must be something behind it, I presume, to fix this camera on. So amazing. Thing. They're very slow to mature these chicks as well, so you'll be able to watch these for days and well <laughs> weeks actually weeks. They they won't start feeding themselves until they're about thirty five to forty days old, and they're in the nest. Forget this, up to seventy days before they'll first take a flight, and it will be ninety days before they're showing any degrees of competence when it comes to flying. So an enormous investment for the adults. Their whole spring and summer is given over to raising these. And great to see three in the nest there. One is typical, two is pretty good. I think it's about 56% of nests have got one in. Two, not quite so common. Only two and a half percent of nests um, get three youngsters in like this. So that's an exceptional view, exceptional bird. Nice way to start the morning, I would say. So do check out those webcams. Remember, Latvian Fund for Nature, and they've got black store as well. Talk sensational. So you're addicted to stuff, which just goes to prove that in lockdown, um, you can transport yourself to see wildlife all over the world. <laughs> Wherever you want. Wherever you want. Yeah. You don't have to you know, worry about what you can see out your window in your own back garden. You can transport yourself all over the world. Weeks stuff. of viewing. Weeks of viewing. Okay. And right on to today's quiz, I think. Oh, okay, go on then. Are you going to do it? I can do the today's okay. quiz. Go on. Got they, are, they are getting significantly crazier, I think, okay. every single time. Yeah. Okay, so here is today's contraption again we have um one of these kind of craft beautifully crafted beautifully crafted things that are meant to imitate a bird sound um again with practice it really does work yeah, with um, practice we need we need more practice really don't we i, 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 I haven't heard work. you practicing well, around the house with no, that actually i can't say I, I I be honest with you i've heard you listening to some pretty awful music whilst you were making dinner last night but not not practicing with no, this no was it maybe tonight i'll, I'll, right. I'll treat you to a tune on this <laughs> yeah beauty. go on then go right. on. okay No, 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 you're trying to play a tune with it, give it to me, give it to me. <laughs> so if you think you know what that might be, it's a beautifully crafted little thing made by a French gentleman. Look at that, what a beautiful little thing that is, yeah. Um, if you think you know which bird this is, then do try and let us know on Twitter, Facebook or YouTube. I'll give you one more little blast, oh, no. yeah. Do you know what? I think I'd get that. You yeah. think? I think I'd get that, yeah. Hmm, interesting. I think I'd get that. <laughs> well, that might be wishful thinking there. I'm not sure about <laughs> that. Um, if you've been watching us this week, you know we've had the fantastic Emma Mitchell on talking about mental health every day with some truly surprising stories about how the natural world actually impacts and improves our mental health. It's the science behind it. You know, I particularly find fascinating. For a long time, we recognised the value of the natural world and us engaging with it, improving our minds, uh, but we've not known why. But now, given contemporary technologies and abilities, we're beginning to understand that. She's talked a lot about brain biochemistry in her first hit on Monday. She told us a remarkable thing about soil bacteria and the way that that can help us, and then also being close to water. And today, she's got another top tip 
for improving our mental state, particularly at this very stressful time under lockdown. Here's Emma. So far this week, I've talked about how spending time next to water and coming into contact with soil can both improve our mental health, shift the balance of our brain biochemicals, make us feel calmer and more uplifted. Really useful during any stressful time and we're in a pandemic, so this is, this is useful stuff. Today I'm going to talk about looking at leaves and you might think, mm, okay botanist, that sounds really odd, but actually the veins on the back of the leaf make a fractal pattern and when humans look at fractals they feel more relaxed. Here's a botanical fractal, right? This is a cardoon leaf from my plants over here. They're like big triffidy thistles. And a fractal is a geometric motif that is repeated on different scales in the same structure. And I think this is beautiful to look at. Now, when human subjects who are part of a research project were given a stressful stimulus, they recovered from it 60% more quickly when they looked at computerized fractal patterns that echoed the patterns of branches of a tree or the veins of a leaf. So that's fascinating. People are recovering from stress more quickly when they're simply looking at computer version, computerized versions of these kinds of patterns. Similarly, if you take a live snapshot of somebody who is looking at fractals, a functional MRI of their brain, the areas that light up are very similar to those that light up when we listen to music. We think about how creative, how calm, how great you can feel when you're listening to music. The same kinds of areas of your brain are, are, are being activated when we look at fractal-like patterns. It makes sense. Our ancestors were out in the ancient forests and woodlands looking for food. They would have saw, seen an awful lot of fractal-like action and we would have got a mental reward by seeing patterns that occurred close to sources of food. I'm going to arrange some leaves now. Now this might sound a bit weird, but I'm hoping that I can bring a bit of fractal calm to your day in the next few seconds. It's not just the fractal patterns on the back of a leaf that can bring calm to your mind when you look at plant forms. The innumerable shades of green that you might come across on your daily walk or maybe a stroll in your garden can also bring relaxation and trigger creativity. The human mind is drawn to curved shapes and soothed by them, so the edge of, edges of leaves and the edges of petals here. But not just that, I'm actually filled with awe at just the variety of shapes, patterns and forms when you look at plants. And if you find some today on your walk, bring some home perhaps, maybe draw them or photograph them and post them on Twitter. But I'm hoping that this small collection today from my garden has brought a little bit of calm to your morning. And now it's back to Chris and Megs in the New Forest. Fractals. My mind is literally blown every uh, time Emma comes on. Isn't it? Because I had absolutely no idea. But of course it makes so much sense, doesn't it? Of course when we were foraging, trying to find food, to have that physiological positive response, mm. it, it mm. does entirely make sense. And it's something that I would I'd never thought about before. See with me it's, not, it's less fractals. I find real comfort in symmetry. Um, symmetry in nature and in other places is very difficult to find. But, you know, the, the comfort of symmetry is something I've always found attractive. You know, I'm drawn to things, no matter what they are, uh, as long as they're symmetrical. But to see that fractals have that sort of effect is, is truly remarkable. So if you are out on your daily exercise today, um, pick a leaf off a tree and look at those veins. Mm. Look at the structure of those things. There's so much fractal uh, uh, apparency in nature that you can uh, you can find something on your doorstep I'm absolutely certain no doubt about that and if you'd like to hear more from Emma then you can follow her on Twitter at Silver Pebble and also on Instagram at Silver Pebble 2 the number 2 uh, so yeah catch up with that more from Emma tomorrow that's been really brilliant you know I think absolutely sensational little series she's put together for us there absolutely thanks Emma yeah thank you very much to Emma part of our broadcast We've been bringing you some amazing sightings that you have been seeing out of your windows, on your local walks, in your local green space. But there was one sighting that caught our eye, wasn't there, when yeah. we were on You're Twitter. not going to get this out your window, though. We're not going to get this out your window. Perhaps if you live very, very close to the coast, particularly on the southwest side, on a lighthouse, you may see it. But this was something that was spotted in Ireland, in Kilkees, by Clark.
have a look at this amazing oh, clip of this group of basking sharks that she has spotted. I mean, it's totally amazing. This, yeah. is, a, this is a migrant species. It's the second largest fish in the world. We have whale sharks and then basking sharks. And you can see basking sharks have got a huge gape. They open their mouths massively and they have incredible gills that almost around the entirety of their heads. And within those gills, they have these gill rakes. And what happens is they can um, filter 2,000 tonnes of water per hour. 2,000 tonnes? What? Per hour, they can. Yes. Amazing. Amazing. And the water goes over these gill rakes um, where they collect zooplankton, which is their primary source of food. But they're fantastic animals. We can see them at the beginning of summer when they return to waters in and around the UK and around Ireland as well. On the British Isles, Isle of Man is a great spot for them too. Mm -hmm. Um, southwest coast southwest coast yeah. the west coast of scotland's really good yeah. you can see them and they often congregate in these groups there's been a group that was found that was 100 strong wow. which is quite rare normally they have you know you might have five six ten perhaps um, and we don't really know a lot about why and um, we think it's to do with breeding behavior but there's still so much left to learn yeah. about sharks so much left to learn um but of course, when you think of sharks, you know, the image that comes to your mind is probably the formidable great white shark. Now, they do kind of migrate northwards, but they haven't, they're not in UK waters by any means. Um, but we do have a lot of sharks in UK waters. And yeah. This is something that we don't think about very often. In fact, we have approximately 41 species of sharks that are in UK waters. And this is um, about 20 of those are found all year round. And when I say sharks, I'm not talking about the big impressive ones so much. I'm talking about things like catfish uh, or nurse hounds. And these are relatively small. And you can see evidence of them uh, when you're walking along the beach. And you can find their egg sacs, which are known as mermaid purses. Mm. So have a look at those. And when, if you are able to get to a beach, near a beach, and can explore there safely, then it has these as well. Because it's something, you know, like feathers that we pick up in woodland. You might find a, a, a shark. And, and you can identify which species of shark it is by the shape mm. and, 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 and texture of the mermaid purse yeah. as well. There's a little guide online, I think, for that. There is. Mm. But seasonally as well, we do get some very sexy shark species coming into the waters. We get something called a shark fin, ma uh, a, a shark fin maker shark. And these are the fastest sharks that we know of. 30 miles an hour um, in waters, and this enables them to catch fast moving prey, things like tuna. Um, so you can see those at um, summertime as well. And of course, thresher sharks too. Now, threshers are one of my favourites. Now, we have the most distinguishing thing about a thresher is its caudal fin. The diversity of caudal fins in sharks is immense. Caudal fins are their tail um, fins. You have, they have these two lobes coming down. So I've drawn a bit of the variation for you here. So you can see this is the upper lobe and the lower lobe and you can see how different these is if, if you have a, a shark with a uh, a caudal fin like this it's a benthic dweller which means it often stays on the bottom of the seashore um but you get a huge variation now the thresher the thresher has a caudal fin to behold honestly so i've drawn it to scale for you here it's a really bad drawing i really apologize um but the, the top lobe is incredibly enlarged it's actually a, pretty much as large as its own body which is pretty amazing it's used for hunting it's the tall group there, using their tail, which they will whip round, and it will help them to catch fish more successfully, which is pretty, pretty fantastic. And I have a love affair with sharks, and I go on about Really? Them. You've already been going on about them. I have been going on about them. So, obviously, we haven't had them on already, but here we are. <laughs> I, I honestly, I there's something about them. I've always loved predatory animals. I find their strength, their, um, the way they move, the way that they kind of control their environment just to be fascinating. And, I'd always worked in terrestrial environments. I didn't have much experience working in a marine environment, um, but I really wanted to go and work with sharks. So um, I went and I worked at the Bimini Biological Field Station. Um, and my first experience was on a, uh, was when we went out to catch sharks and we caught this female tiger shark. Um, and we trained incredibly carefully on how to work up these sharks to get scientific measurements from them. Um, so you kind of measure the dorsal fin, the fin on the top, we give all these biological samples that help us understand more because we really don't know much about these species. Um, so I've been there twice now. Um, and on the second visit, I was working a lot with juvenile lemon sharks. Um, and they are housed in kind of semi-captive pens for a period of a couple of weeks to learn more about them. And I'm really excited to say that one of my very, very good friends, 
Felicity Delens is here to tell us a little bit about her PhD work that she's been doing on these sharks, which is something incredibly fascinating and I think will make us all think a bit better about sharks and their reputation. So here is a bit about her work. Hello everybody, my name is Felicie Delem and today I will tell you a little bit about the project that I'm doing with the Bimini Biological Field Station looking at sharks' personality. But first of all, let me introduce you to what animal personality is. Here are two videos of two different juvenile lemon sharks. They've been put in those circular enclosures and at, in the middle of these enclosures we have placed an object that they have never seen before. Now, if you look at the behavior of those two individuals, you will notice that the shark on the left is very interested in this novel object and is investigating it, whereas the other one is doing its best to avoid it. Um, if we were to give these sharks a score for how attracted to novelty they are, the shark on the left would get a much higher score than the shark on the right because it's way more attracted to novelty, right? Now, if we redid the same experiment a few weeks later, the shark on the left would still have a much higher score in attraction to novelty than the shark on the right. And that is what animal personality is. It is the fact that an animal's behavior is consistent. And therefore, in a test like the one I've just showed you, you would be able to predict an animal's score based on its scores in the past. There are two main reasons why I think this is fascinating. First, from an ecological standpoint, it does not seem to make a lot of sense for an animal to be predictable in its behavior if it's trying to catch prey or to avoid predators. Also, you would expect that an animal can adjust its behavior to the ecological conditions it's in, for example, be attracted to novelty when novelty is not dangerous and novelty is very rewarding and be avoiding novelty when novelty is dangerous and not rewarding. So we don't fully understand why animals would have personality in the first place and that's incredible. The second reason why this is fascinating is because it can have implications for conservation. It is a critical concept that we need to integrate with conservation. If certain sharks are indeed more likely to be attracted to novelty, they might be more susceptible to fishing, for example. But these same sharks, if they're more attracted to novelty, they might also be better at finding new food sources and at growing faster, or they might be better at, fi at finding sexual partners and have more offsprings. So our fishing activities might unintentionally target these very productive individuals and that's why animal personality is a concept that's important for conservation in the future. In order to study animal personality, a scientist has to observe multiple individuals in a captive test, but not only once, they have to do it multiple times in order to find this consistent behavior. And of course, this is much easier to do on your captive aquarium fishes than it is to do on grizzly bears. And so the vast majority of animal personality studies have been done on small captive animals that, and very little is known about the causes and consequences of personality in the wild. And this is the knowledge gap that with the Bimini Biological Field Station, we decided to try filling and we used the juvenile lemon sharks as a study model. As you may know, the Bimini juvenile lemon shark population has been studied for many, many years by our founder, Doug Gruber, since the 90s. It has been the shark lab's main study species for many years, and we know very well how to capture them, keep them in captivity and healthy, and monitor them in the wild after release. This makes them the perfect candidates for a personality study that incorporates captive testing and wild experiments. And I think that's all for today. That's all I'm going to say about animal personality. I hope you enjoyed the little lesson. Sharks with big personalities. Mm. It's pretty cool, isn't it? A lot of people don't imagine animals as having personalities. I think they open their filter eyes and they think that they all look the same. They've all come out exactly the same mould. But if you watch your bird feeders, mm. 
care distinguishing marks on some of the birds and you'll recognize that even yeah. they have different personalities they'll come from a different direction they'll land on a different port they spend different amounts of time there they'll interact with other species quite differently so you can see that in, mm. in most species but sharks a lot of people think they're just cold eyed cold-hearted Killers, anything they? but they're really not at all they're so curious and they're so interested in people they're incredibly lovely animals to be around so full of character um, but I think it's really important to say that in those experiments they are only kept in those semi-captive pens for a very short period of time before they are released back into the wild and everyone who's involved in the project uh, and is involved with handling these animals is, is trained to do so specifically um, but it's just amazing and Felice's research is also showing that not only do they have personalities the individuals with similar personality traits, particularly juvenile lemon sharks, when they're in mangroves and they're more social, actually prefer to be socialised with individuals of similar personality traits. So they will resonate themselves. So sharks have friends. The sharks telling. have friends. Sharks have friends. They hang out with a particular set of people, you know getting snobby about, oh, I eat this, oh, I don't eat that. I like that bit of the mangrove over there. I'm in the mangrove, you're not in the mangrove. <laughs> yeah, hey, look at those guys over there, though. those people aren't in the mangrove. Oh, what a bunch of sharks. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly what happened, yeah. <laughs> Lindsay Chapman is now joining us from Manchester. You better take over soon. We're losing it a little bit here this morning. We've all gone very sharky, Lindsay. How are you? All right. I'm in the mangrove. I'm in the gang. It's all cool. Yeah, uh, it's good. <laughs> yes, all good uh, here in Manchester. Thank you. Yes, and I'm going to storm in at this point before we to go totally mad. Many, many people chatting away this morning, which is lovely to see. Get this. Patricia Hale says hi from the USA, from Philadelphia, where it's 4 a.m. She's keen to watch. And Carolyn says, can we say hello to her grandson, who is one year old? and watches the program already. Um, so much love for Emma this morning is absolutely fascinating. And Susan says she now understands why she's fascinated by leaves, why she looks at them, she photographs them, she takes them home. So it's things we don't think about, isn't it? Absolutely incredible. And um, many cats and dogs this morning on Facebook going a little bit bonkers for the quiz. So um, you've set something off there. Just want to talk about sharks because the reaction to sharks, it's an interesting one, Megs. You said that people often have this quite averse reaction to them, which is quite unfounded, really. I did some work on sharks and it was absolutely fantastic. Um, Maggie Harris says that she's seen basking sharks off Cornwall and off the Lizard as well. Not a bad place to go and have a look. And Jasper, age six, says, I like sharks and great whites can smell blood from three miles away, which just shows what incredible senses they've got. Alexandra Wakefield says, how many eggs can and a shark produce you talked about mermaids purses of course mm. Mm. they can produce quite a few they will produce quite a few i'm not entirely sure on the exact number it will depend of course on the different species because um a lot of sharks are egg producing particularly the smaller sharks and those sharks are, have a huge diversity so i mean i'm not 100 percent sure on that perhaps i'll do a bit of research and get back to you on that one but um they do produce a, quite a few i believe i can tell you one one thing about sharks and that is that some of them actually retain their eggs inside their body as things like reptiles do as well so they appear to give birth to live young but in fact they've just kept the eggs inside their body because either they want to invest in parental care as soon as they're hatched they want to be near them or perhaps they're living in colder environments and the animal's body heat sort of kind of incubates the eggs inside the body um, sometimes those eggs hatch before they give birth so then you've got the free you know egg free if you like sharks inside the body of the female and in some species to one another so the young shark will eat another young shark whilst it's still inside the body of the female. That's quite common with tiger sharks. And in fact, there was an ultrasound done where you could see that behaviour happening. Oh, amazing. Amazing. That's survival of the fittest before it even starts. It certainly is. And those mermaids' purses, if you do see them underwater, I did go scuba diving to have a little look at them. And um, you can actually see the live young inside them. You can sort of see through the egg case, which is just astonishing. And that's something you can pick up on a British beach, you know, and take it home and keep it in the mermaid's purse. I want to show you both, though, another young naturalist. So this little clip came in from Caroline Blackie uh, with her seven year old. She went out, she did a nature walk. And this is what happened. I just seen a cuckoo above my head today. Cuckoo, cuckoo.
That's right. He spotted a cuckoo. Excellent work there. Very much enjoyed that little clip. And I also spotted something from Linda Simpson. Now, she's got this slow-mo footage of a blackbird and a starling. And I just wanted to talk about ways to watch nature. So we've talked about the hashtag wildlife from my window, the fact that you can see some great stuff by not even leaving your house or your flat. But slow-mo clips, you know, they offer you a different way to look at birds and animals. And what's really lovely about this is you can see the behavior of the blackbird. It sort of weighs up whether to leave or not. The starling comes in, you can see its wingspan. And who doesn't love a bit of slow-mo footage? So it's just to say, think about different ways that you can watch nature so many ways to get connected which we're always talking about and um someone that did that really well is marion halls she took a clip of one of my favorites this is a little owl and i don't know what you two think but they tend to look pissed off quite a lot of the time a little bit grumpy you know why are you taking this picture of me and um you know birds of prey really interesting we've had loads of questions on them during the run and I've got a question here from Simone Whittle who says what kinds of nests do kestrels, buzzards, sparrowhawks make because she's never seen one? That's a big question because they're all slightly different. Yes they are yeah so basically little owls will make a nest in a hollow so they are a hole nesting species they like holes in trees but they'll equally go into buildings too I found one in a piece of old farm machinery once where they were raising their young successfully. And they don't bring anything into the nest at all. They rely on any debris that's in there. And of course, whilst they're in there, producing lots of pellets, and they can then form a soft base to that nest. Uh, ditto kestrels, really. Kestrels are a whole nesting species, although they will also nest in other old nests, things like crows and sparrowhawks. Uh, and uh, yeah, what else have I found them in? Rooks, occasionally, very occasionally. Um, if the colony's been deserted, the rookery's been deserted. Um, and again, they don't add anything to their nest. They'll just basically uh, be laying their eggs on top of the pellets. Buzzards, on the other hand, are nest builders. They build their own nests. And uh, they will repair a nest from previous years if it's still quiet and in a good place. Or sometimes they'll build a new nest uh, to start the year off. And they're a relatively bulky structure, quite easy to see up in the tree. So there are a lot of variation in birds of prey as to how they approach the nest building process. There you go. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, also, I did say before the show, I sent a little tweet out saying a um, bit of a spoiler. I'm going to show you some foxes this morning and um, we've got all kinds of bits of footage coming in. And I wanted to show you both an urban fox and a rural flock. Sir has sent in this wonderful footage that I think must be in her garden of a vixen and some cubs feeding. I think you've seen this footage, Chris and Megs. Just um, tell us a little bit about what's going on there. Well, the cubs have left the den um, and it won't be too far away. So it could probably be in that garden or a neighbor's garden. And she's been caught in the open by a hungry, hungry bunch of cubs. And, and once they're all attached like that, it's very difficult for her to move away and shake them all off. So she's been ambushed, frankly. There are a lot of and, cubs. Uh, and there's there. an enormous number of cubs there, which is brilliant to see. Uh, and what an absolute delight at this time of year, if you're lucky enough to see fox cubs, in, in your garden or in, in any space that you can explore, then, um, yeah, absolutely incredible, incredible stuff. They, I love that. they are I love incredible. That. They are incredible. And actually, you know, I, I've seen more urban foxes in the last few years than I have seen rural foxes. There's, I know there's a real swing there, but um, be, be a bit wild. Me and be a bit wild. Last night, <laughs> we were trying to get this fox footage across, and I'm so pleased that she persisted until late in the evening with Fabian as well, because this is a rural fox that she has got footage of. Now, her camera moves slightly. It's sort of got knocked, so they're off to the side. Do look carefully. They're beautiful. It's a fox with nine cubs. Imagine having nine babies. And she says she wonders if there are two vixens sharing the cubs. She says she knows that subordinate adults can help with rearing and bringing up the, the young. But have you ever heard of two birthing and sharing the suckling of cubs? Well, the, the relationship with female foxes is quite complex. So they live in female groups, as it were, with roaming males in amongst them. Young males will stay in those groups until they start roaming, of course. And within the group, you have a dominant female, uh, which typically is the one that gives birth to the litter and will have to look after them. Occasionally, however, the subordinate females will also um, get pregnant and give birth to a litter, not 
typically in the same den, that wouldn't be tolerated. It would be in another part of those animals' ranges. And then when, if they're, birth, if they're given birth at you know, pretty much the same time, then those two litters will come together. And we've seen on Spring Watch, I think we had a litter once of 12. Now, that's pretty, you know, probably impossible for a single fox to give birth to 12. So that must have been a combined litter. They just happened to be at exactly the same age. And I imagine that's what's happening here is exactly the same. So perhaps even related females have both given birth close to one another and they're now the, they crashed the young. Now, whether both of them are now suckling them alternately, I, I, I don't know. But um, this has to be a case of that. There's, there's no doubt about that. Well, thank you very much for answering that. We've been watching them for a little little while and it is absolutely gorgeous lovely comments coming in to say um brilliant to see british wildlife so close up i'm going to leave you um with one final question many people are saying that they've really enjoyed these broadcasts and we'll talk a bit more about that on friday i'm going to be back on friday but hannah has been watching the whole run she's a natural history student at the university of south wales and she's really keen to engage other other particularly uni students, Megan, and that can be a difficult age range because you've got an awful lot going on at that time. Is there anything that you could suggest that she could maybe do at her uni? Yeah, I mean, I used to um, run the Zoological Society at University of Liverpool. I was part of a team that we did that for the year, and it was great to organise talks from unexpected guests to come in. You came in, didn't you? I, I was unexpected. You were unexpected. <laughs> That's a good guess. Unexpected. <laughs> but it was really good to have like a range of different people coming in to give talks, but really informally as well. So, you know, university students, you know, we all organise pizza nights or movie nights or, you know, watching a documentary we used to watch like Racing Extinction or things like that, um, which gather loads of people in. And, you know, if, if you've got free pizza and stuff there, you get students to come in and then they get hooked. They get hooked and they come back. And it's not just the free pizza. They love the information too. So that's, I think it's that's the free something. pizza. <laughs> I'm, I'm so I pleased. I it was vegan pizza, that's all. Yeah. I'm so pleased that one of your top tips is to give them free stuff because then they will come and that is how we will get them. <laughs> that's ace. Well, look, thank you very much indeed for answering those questions. Just wonderful pictures, videos coming in, comments as well. And like I say, I will be back on Friday to bring you some of the very best, but I'll catch you soon. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, Thanks Lindsay. Lindsay. Great to see those foxes. Absolutely, Absolutely amazing. Brilliant. Yeah, I know. So, our fox cubs haven't appeared yet this year. We've seen lactating females, so they're obviously here somewhere, but they've not come to the feeding station out just out here in the woods. So looking forward to that. It's yeah. going to be a highlight of the spring and summer, of course. Now, Emma Mitchell has been telling us how you know, nature can provide a cure for us, but we also have to be conscious in these troubled times, provide a cure for nature too. So I'm very pleased that Nick Atchison, known as at the marsh tit on twitter at the marsh tit on twitter has put this little film together it's a very eloquent piece about how we should engage with nature but at the same time offer something back over to you nick for hundreds of thousands of years our ancestors have depended on a relationship with nature in order to survive they've needed to know which were the best soils for sowing crops when to set out hunting and which leaves would cure a tummy ache or heal a wound. It's only in the most recent moments of our evolution that we've divorced ourselves from this relationship with nature. And it's to our detriment. More than ever in our history, we need nature now in order to function healthily and happily as human beings. And ironically, more than ever before, nature needs us in order to set back the balance. Because for the past 150 years, our relationship with nature has largely been extractive and abusive. 30 Days Wild is just one initiative from the Wildlife Trust aimed at restoring our relationship with nature and nationally once again declaring our love of nature. It's a month-long celebration of everything that's beautiful about the British landscape and the wild creatures that live in it. It's a reaffirmation of what nature means to us and everything that we can mean to nature. All you have to do to take part is do one random act of wildness every day for the month of June. Now, we don't yet know what our countryside will look like in June, where we'll be allowed to go and how free we'll be to explore. But wherever you live in the British landscape, right in the centre of a city or here as I live in the countryside, there is wildlife all around you, waiting to be discovered and explored.
anything that you do to help restore your relationship with nature counts as a random act of wildness. If it's safe and you have permission and somebody knows where you are, you can climb a tree. I've chosen a young oak which grows by the bank of the River Wenson, my favourite river in Norfolk. Now, climbing a tree is an awesome way to reconnect with nature, both to feel the majesty of these beings, but also to reflect on how fleeting our own lives are in the landscape. It's also a great way to watch wildlife. A muntjac passed underneath a moment ago, not knowing I was even here, and singing all around me there are birds. There's a great tit singing in front of me saying, and just to my left a wood pigeon is singing, and he says, careful COVID, be careful COVID, be careful COVID. Oh. You can lie in the grass too, with your head in a bed of Jamanda Speedwell. Lying on the ground is the best way to feel your connection with nature. To think about the soil just beneath you and where it comes from. To think about the rocks beneath that and deep down the molten core of the earth. Or look up into the sky and watch swallows or swifts just back from their epic journeys to Africa. Even in the centre of cities there will be birds flying over you. There will be peregrines hunting pigeons and rose-ringed parakeets. So lie on the grass and think about nature. You can even sit on the bank of the river with your toes in the very cold water and feed the ducks with peas. Not bread, bread does them no good at all, but peas they absolutely love. Wherever in the UK you live, there is wildlife. Even if you're stuck indoors, the Wildlife Trust has webcams in the nests of stone curlews, common terns, peregrines and ospreys, which can all be found by visiting their website. Wildlife has never needed our love more than it does today. So to begin your journey, falling in love again with British wildlife and British wild habitat, why not commit to a random act of wildness every day for the month of June? To find out about taking part in 30 Days Wild, follow the Wildlife Trust on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, or visit their website. We need a revolution in the way we relate to wildlife. And the revolution begins with you. Excellent stuff. I'm very eloquent. Mm. Um, I, I say worthy, and I don't mean that in, a, in any way disparaging, because everything that Nick said there was true. You know, we do subconsciously or consciously take from nature. We do that every day when we eat and, and when we go out to replenish ourselves in that in, environment. And we've got to start giving it back. So Wildlife mm -hmm. Trust, uh, 30 Days Wild is running throughout June. Um, you've got to do a random act of wildness, basically. That's every all it day. takes every day for 30 days. And it will be enormously beneficial for you and the wild world too. Mm. Thanks, Nick. That was really good. He's got a quiz as well. He does. You can see Nick on his Twitter feed at the Marsh Pit at quarter to eight on Tuesday. It's a very bird-oriented quiz. A birdie nerdy, a nerdy yeah. birdie quiz. A nerdy quiz. birdie quiz, as it was described to us. So you can take part in that over on his Twitter feed at quarter to eight next Tuesday, which will be great fun, I'm sure. He's going to be doing some podcasts too, I think. Yeah. yeah. Really good stuff. guy. Really good girl. So coming up next, um, we have some amazing photographs from Paul Goldstein. Uh, today he's talking to us about another of his favourite animals, another of his obsessions. Mm -hmm. He's many obsessions, mm. Paul Goldstein. He's an obsessive personality. He's an obsessive personality. But he Nothing loves, wrong with that. No, absolutely not. He absolutely loves these animals. And what he says in this video is so poignant. Yeah. Um, it's really, you know, impressive. And the photographs are fantastic. But I think, I think I'm going to leave it to him, really. Yep. So over to Paul. This is Mabel. This is the culprit uh, from yesterday in the great bedwitting heist that affected myself and Chris. I'm not on Wilman and Common anymore, still in SW19. She wants to get down and cause havoc somewhere else. Uh, and in fact, all I can hear at the moment is a couple of sparrows. We had a few goldfinches and blue tits. Um, when, like all of us, you have moments of introspection and you, you think of where you'd like to be or rather be, 
um, my thoughts often go to to India and to Bengal Tigers. They often go to a day uh, when I was first in India, I think in 98, uh, and I, I went to a national park and had a poor sort of route and I wasn't expecting to see anything and everything changed. And, and frankly, it, it was, uh, people talk about life-changing seminal moments. Uh, that, that really was the one for me. And um, yeah, uh, Bengal Tigers, uh, this dusty buffer zone, uh, 22 years ago, it started an obsession which was fueled by compassion and rage. The, the dream is, is that a, a tiger in the wild on its own, uncorralled, untrammeled, unflustered, and frankly photographing them, it's just a question of trying not to quiver too much uh, with excitement uh, and trying to get it, just trying to get it sharp, I suppose. They're endangered. They are. We all know why. Uh, it's particularly pertinent at the moment. The, the, the nonsense of, of traditional medicine. And for me to, to find one just in good light is a mission I've spent months of my life on this quest, or actually let's call it a pilgrimage. Uh, uh, and I've often rarely gambled with my camera uh, with one because the moment is often too fleeting. Um, sometimes you see a litter though, you know, to see them together, whether they're sub-adults like this or, or even youngsters, uh, is something remarkable. They scrap a bit, they fight a bit, like, uh, like all felines. Uh, but when you see them actually tied together, Blake's fabled yet unrhyming symmetry line has double significance. I think Bengal tigers hunt about as well as lions, so finding one with a kill is unusual, but the real, almost visceral thrill is when they have cubs. Uh, that, that is just one of the great thrills, because you think there's a future, and my finger will fuse with my shutter release when, the, when that happens. Uh, yeah, youngsters. Uh, the youngest I've seen is about four or five months. It, it matters when you think just how valuable they are. Uh, they really are. You know, a, a dead one poached for its pelt and its hide, a young one here up a tree, is worth about 30 or 40,000. You know, a live one is worth millions to so many. They like water, cats and water. No, no, they love it, they really do. I drove past that dam for about 15 years before I saw that. There's your William Blake line again of the, the symmetry, two of them cooling off. And someone asked me the other day, this sequence here, how long I wait, how long did you wait for that, Paul? And yeah, I, I answered about 20 years. This was faunal alignment on a stratospheric scale, uh, Chris, because sadly Indian bureaucracy will do its best always to thwart you. But when it comes together, when you see youngsters like this and you know there's a future, it's a drug far more potent than anything man-made. Do they have a future? I don't know, but I tell you this, the evils of traditional medicine which fuels poaching has driven a middle-aged man to do foolish things, as you can see, but heartfelt lengths, partly to quell uh, this unshakable addiction, but partly because of my rage uh, to what happens to them. Keep their future burning bright. Perhaps my the or these foolish things are sometimes necessary. Now, we like going out to take photographs. We enjoy it immeasurably because we want to create a visual image, a piece of art almost in our photography. But photography has you know, a much greater meaning in a way because photographs can be one of the most powerful tools for conservation. They display a story. They tell, you know, they give you, make you feel emotions by, just by looking at it. They draw you into that animal. You want, you, you want to understand more about it. They're incredible tools. They're not restricted by the boundaries of language. You can show an image all over the world and have a similar response. So they are so, so important, not you know, for our own enjoyment, but for communication about these conservation stories too. And Paul does some amazing work conserving these animals. Yeah, he's raised, his raised hundreds of thousands of pounds for as as conservation yes. in, in India. Um, he's been doing marathons where he dresses as a tiger. He's got like a tiger suit, which is enormously heavy. He's done yeah. any number of marathons running all over the world in ridiculous places. Up and down mountains, I think. Up as and well. down mountains, all around India, of course, in the, in the UK too. He's raised thousands of pounds for tiger conservation as, uh, to, you know, to continue to fuel that passion to look after them. Remarkable great Paul Goldstein. And again, another very eloquent piece. I've got one more photo that he didn't put in his montage. I quite like It's this one. I like a bit of movement in mm. my photographs. So a bit these, abstract. Yeah, slightly abstract here. Um, I wouldn't say the composition's perfect. I'll give it a sort of a 0.8 out of 10, this one. That's pretty good. That's, that's pretty high for me. 0.8. <laughs> 0. That 8. is pretty 0. 0.8, that's a bit harsh, maybe. Yeah. Okay, so 0.95. Um, I'll, I'll stretch to a 9.5 on that one. But uh, he's a great photographer. Mm. Do check 
out his work and you can find that at paul uh, well paulgoldstein.co.uk and on instagram paul goldstein with no gap between the between the paul and the goldstein so check him out okay quiz time quiz round well, before we start Yes, well, we had uh, lots of responses from you guys, from your pets, responding to our bird quiz. And we were sent in this gant of her dog responding to the call, which is just brilliant, the way that he's moving his head around. Yeah, it's really caught his attention. <laughs> has it caught the attention, uh, you know, of our ID experts? That's the thing. So has anyone got it right? They please? have done, actually. They've got it right, have Yeah, they? we do. So on Facebook, we've got Anise, Yvonne. Gary, Janice, Dean, Simon, Margaret, Natasha, Claire, Nigel, Twitter, Paul S, YouTube, we've got Vivian, Paula, Luke, Nina, Sai and Michelle. Gary, obviously. A lapwing. Obviously. A pea wit. It's like the... <laughs> it's the pea and the wit. So, it's the pea wit. I think with practice, it could even sound like a lapwing. <laughs> Maybe you breathe in. Let me just try breathing in. No, oh, no, that doesn't work. No, it doesn't work either. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll get back to the drawing board with our French devices. <laughs> Only a couple more to go. Don't really apologise. To tantalise you. Oh, yeah, but in the right hands, in the hands of a, you know, a, a French craftsman, they actually do sound like the birds. We are, but no, look, it must we are not French craftsmen. No, no, I'm, any... no I'm not a French, definitely not a French craftsman. Right, one more go. Oh, it sounds like a lapwing. I'd have got that. I'd have got that. Coming up tomorrow, we've got Lizzie Daly live. Uh, we've got mm -hmm. some of the staff of the Natural History Museum telling us about their passions, which should be good as well. Project Diaries, Lee Gardner, always fantastic. I love mm -hmm. it. Oh, Short, brilliant. sharp, simple, really effective. Again, a great communicator for Lee Gardner. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, Emma Mitchell, too. So we'll see you tomorrow at mm -hmm. 9 in the morning. And just for your dogs and just for your cat. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Have a great day. <laughs>